Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Sean, and I'm an alcoholic. Oh, you're going to have to forgive me tonight if I keep coughing. I did, I did try and get out of this shit. <laughs> And uh, I phoned Wayne up on the way down, and I was probably having a coughing attack. And I said, "Look, it's been recorded. You know, I don't want to ruin my shit. I want to listen to it again. Being self-centered and that, but uh, <laughs> didn't work. So, but yeah, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, I've just turned 11 years sober. I know this is a 10-year sober share, but I've been trying to dodge it for a year, and it hasn't, you know, finally caught up with me. So." But it is a privilege to be here tonight. And uh, Tony, I just love your share. You know, you, what you said, where you come from, you know, and, and look at you now. It's, yeah. it's great. This is what this does. This is, you know, uh, when I came into AA, I, I, I hadn't lost everything, but emotionally I had, you know, I still had, you know, clothes on my back and everything, and I, I had a little bit of money in the bank. But emotionally I was bankrupt and uh, you know I, I, I heard people sharing their stories and I identified with you know why they was drinking not just like you know for a few years I, I realized I, I did have a drink problem and I needed to sort it out but I didn't realize what an alcoholic was I, for years I was drinking and I, I didn't think I fitted the alcoholic criteria right I didn't, uh, I had a car and a van on my drive. I had a nice house. I had a job. I had a girlfriend. So I cannot be an alcoholic. That's what I thought. But it, it was through coming here that I realized, you know, that that wasn't what an alcoholic was. You know, uh, I remember coming to a meeting on a Tuesday night from a treatment center. I was in there for six months and, uh, I remember in that treatment centre just like going up and down through emotions, just, you know, bouncing off the walls in there. And it's because I hadn't had a drink for like six months. I was, uh, that was the first period of sobriety since I started drinking from probably the age of 13 to 14. That, that period there was probably the longest I ever went without any self medication. And I remember coming here on a Tuesday night. Full of fear. I, I came into this room and people were coming up to me all jolly and that, wanting to shake my hands. And I was like, oh. head down, frowning. Dave used to say how much I used to frown. You know, just got people walking away from me. But, uh, but that's what I was like, you know. Uh, and then I heard these people talking about, you know, it wasn't just alcohol that was the problem here. For years, you know, I had this problem, because Tony just said it as well. I had a problem with life and I had a problem with getting on with people and a problem with sort of like any type of responsibility and, you know, anything that just seemed, uh, everything seemed a chore. You know, people used to rub me up the wrong way and I reacted badly to a lot of things. But I couldn't see that I, it was me that was the problem. And uh, I remember... T- sharing that night there was a guy there who was in a suit looking really smart sitting up the table on a Tuesday night and he was sharing his story and I, I, and I was blown away because I, I from where he said he'd come from like you Tony where he said he'd come from and to where he was now and you know he was, you could tell he wasn't making it up you could tell he wasn't acting it and you know something had happened to him uh, and he spoke about how he felt as well I really identified with that you know how he felt when he wasn't drinking and it made me realise the reason why I like to drink, you know. But the problem was, when I had a drink, uh, I didn't know when to stop. It says in the big book, uh, to define yourself as an alcoholic, it says, if when you honestly want to, you, f- you find you cannot qu- quit entirely, or you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably an alcoholic. And, and that was it. That's what brought me into AA. 
the first, like, initially was the lack of control because that took me to the treatment centre. Lack of control because I couldn't control it. I'd get into all sorts of uh, consequences, which, you know, led me to want to get my drinking sorted out. And I did try AA in London, but I, I wasn't ready. And I, I didn't hear nothing about the 12 steps or any type of, you know, or probably even if they, if I did at that time, if they mentioned stuff about a spiritual way of life, I just would have, no, nah, not for me, you know. Because I was offered a treatment centre and it was by the seaside, I thought I'd have a bit of that instead, you know, go on holiday. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I ended up down here. Like in 2005, I, I came down here in a treatment centre. Uh, and, and this is how I found the meeting because I remember I was, <coughs> I'd just come out of the treatment centre, thought I was going to just stay in Plymouth for a little while and uh, get a job, start making new friends and all that and make a new start in life. Because I thought, I can't go back to London because it was all my mate's fault, really, that I ended up in this position because, you know, it's all to do with the people that you're hanging about with and everything else and, like, you know, or you, the family that I've got and all because they're, like, you know, they're part of the problem. And so I thought I'd make a go of it down there. And I remember walking around in that flat one night. It was only about a week after leaving the treatment centre and I was pacing up and down this small little flat. And... uh I just, I, it just came upon me. Fear was on me that I, I was just gonna, I was gonna pick up a drink, and I knew it, you know. And so, I remember the lads used to come back when I was in treatment. They used to come to this meeting, and they used to come, uh, they used to go to other AA meetings, and they'd come back and they'd be all jolly, and they'd be talking about the meeting and all that. And I, I just didn't want, I didn't want to hear it, you know, because my experience of AA before wasn't, wasn't enthusiastic, put it that way. So. Uh, and I wasn't in that space, you know, having jolly people around me. I wasn't, I didn't need that, you know. I was, it wound me up, to be honest with you. Uh, so I remember pacing up that flat thinking, I, I, I'm going to go to that meeting because I need to be around people uh, that are in recovery at least, you know. I weren't going to do nothing when I come here. I was just going to hang about with them and see if that, like, well, I thought that probably would work. At the time, I thought, yeah, just hang about with people in recovery. Be all right. And, uh, but when I went and I sat down and I listened, it just clicked there and then, you know, that I had something, uh, something fatal, really. It's a, a, a fatal illness. That's what, that's what I, I learned that night. It was something that, it says, I don't, something about the, the door shut or clanged or something. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, what's it on the big book? Uh, I don't profess to be any type of a uh, expert on the big book. But, uh, I remember seeing that bit in there and it says like, uh, and that's what it felt like. It just felt like I, I was doomed unless I did something. And I didn't really know at first until I started listening to everyone else that there was something here. And you could see it in the people, most definitely. You could see they'd done something to get out of the rut they was in. When they were talking their stories, it was like, and look at you now, that they've obviously done something. And I was told it was a, it was a, a process, and it was called the 12-step program. Uh, you know, all these people had gone through that process and changed. They had what was called like a, a change of thought and attitude and a, an awakening. They changed from inside and... And that's what I needed, you know, because everything I tried in life, I tried, I tried a pair of trainers every other week. That's, that's, <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, it does work for a couple of days when you get a new pair of trainers, like, when, you're in the, when you're in treatment. Only a couple of days, though. And, uh, you know, nice cars. Uh, everything just wasn't enough. It was just like, I, I was just trying to fix me all. Uh, but the, the thing was, Unless you had, unless I had uh, the knowledge of what was wrong with me, I was never going to get well. And I'm just so grateful to you lot for giving me that knowledge that night that there was something far worse than just a drink problem. Uh, and that night, I just got a sponsor. I went up to Andy Red Jacket. Where is he? Where are you? Oh, uh, there he is. You're right, mate. 
I have a lot to Andy. He took me through the steps, and uh, I just thought I'm going to do this. And it it was more it was more because I everyone, especially at this meeting, everyone was saying how life was wonderful. You know how you could have what you want in life. You know how, how you could live your dreams and that sort of thing. That's the sort of thing that made me realise. You know there is something here, and. Uh, I wanted that. And so I got a sponsor and straight away he, he, he said to me, like, like that night, he gave me a little pack and he said, you do these things. And I, I was thinking, well, they're not hard things to do. They weren't hard or anything, but I just thought, I've just done treatment for six months. How can you tell me I'm going to do these little uh, things here, suggestions they call them, uh, and that's going to work for me. You know, there's people spending thousands and, you know, millions on treatment centres and everything. And this is for nothing. And you're telling me, do this, do this, do this, and I'm going to be all right. But it's because of you lot did it that made me do it. If I'd never seen the evidence, I wouldn't have done it. It just, I, it wouldn't have happened. You know, I wouldn't, I needed to see the evidence. And uh, it was it that night, you know. Uh, so I went away and I did those things and... Uh, I started to feel better pretty quickly as well. I started to feel better. Uh, still a bit angry though. <laughs> <laughs> that took quite a while ago, really. But you know, I was feeling better, and, I, and the, the the biggest thing that for me that was really keeping me keeping my spirits up and bringing me back each time was having a meeting where every week people were just enthusiastic. And saying how their lives are just getting better. That kept me coming back, you know, because there was tough times in early recovery. And sometimes you, you know, when you come in, some people find it easier than others. And, and it's just the way it is. But, if, you know, if you are new and you're just in and you're finding it difficult, just keep doing it. That's all you got to do is keep doing it. Because it will, it does get better, 100%. I mean, I, had, I did have a tough time in early recovery. But a lot of it was my own doing, but I didn't really... Uh, I thought it was the will of God. <laughs> and uh, it definitely weren't, but it felt like it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I just got a lot of admiration for my sponsor at the back there for like, sticking with me uh, over the last 11 years, really. And... It's through people like Wayne, John F, Andy, Alexis, these people that have been here for over 20 years now that make me still do this as well. You know, if there's no one in front of me, I'm the sort of person that I struggle with discipline. I, I, you know, I won't... I won't fall in line you know it's not and I need some I need people to sort of look up to and and you know uh, respect really for me to uh, like I say the evidence I need to see the evidence I need to um, and hear these people when I hear these people still telling me that it gets better when you you're further on in recovery and that's what I need to hear even now you know because I haven't got I haven't got this thing sussed never will have I suffer from alcoholism. When I don't do this program now, I suffer from alcoholism. Still, it doesn't go away. Uh, you know, I still put these actions in uh, in my life daily. Not not perfectly. Sometimes perfectly. Sometimes really badly. Sometimes uh, all right. And uh, you know. I just don't work a perfect program. I'm not a perfect uh, human being. But what I've learned over the over the years now is it's all right to fail. It's all right to mess up, and you know it's all right to make a mistake. It's all right to uh, realize and accept that I'm not perfect. I'm I'm, I'm not ever gonna be uh, because. That, that was another thing for me that really I struggled with in life, is if I don't get this right all the time, 
I'm going to look bad to everyone else. I worried about what everyone thought about me. You know, I, I suffered with uh, loads of uh, hundred forms of self delusion and fears and whatever. It's, it's great that he says that in the big book, actually, because the way they describe it is, you know, anxiety, fear, all these things. It's just, it was just like I just couldn't, I couldn't. Uh, I was too flawed. And because I was too flawed, I couldn't accept that as well. And, you know, through my life, I'd, prior, coming, uh, prior coming here, uh, before knowing about uh, what was wrong with me, <coughs> I could see now, looking back, that how much self-will I was actually running on. I had no power to deal with anything in my life because I, I had to get things... I thought if I get things right and I manage myself, my, manage my life right, then that's when happiness comes along. If only I can manage life, happiness is the end result of it. But someone like me doesn't manage his life well without a program. Someone like me makes it worse and doesn't even see it happening. It doesn't see it happening. I think I'm doing, I think I'm doing uh, well-meaning stuff sometimes as well but I just cannot get my act together. I just struggle with it. But today, I, uh, I realise that. That's why I'm still here, not, you know. And that's why I've always done what I've done, is because I realise I cannot get my act together, emotionally. And it's always going to be like that for the rest of my life, you know. That's the doom and gloom over now. <laughs> But uh, who cares? I'll fan saying it nowadays. You know, I, I don't sit there in doom and gloom thinking, oh, you know, I'm an alcoholic and I can't get my act together because I can get it together today. You know, I've got, uh, I've got a program that really does, when people say it works in rough going, it really does work in rough going. And I've had experience of that. I've had experience of still coming to meetings and sharing and, you know, helping other alcoholics when my life's not been going to plan. Uh, not been thinking about alcohol because that obsession had me in a, it had me in its grip for years. I couldn't. I'd go, you know, possibly a couple of weeks without drinking, but I would always be thinking about it. So even times of trouble now, nothing. I don't get that thinking of, oh, I've got to have a drink. It just ain't there no more. I've been placed in a position of neutrality, 100%. I do not think about alcohol. Not drinking is easy. It is easy to not to drink with this. You know, it's, uh, life's not always easy. Life can be testing at times. You know, but when you're around enthusiastic people, it does help. It really helps when you're in an enthusiastic environment when it's not going to plan. Have I got two minutes left? Yeah. That's better than being around people who just, like, some meetings I go to, they're on a different planet. They can't be the same sort of alcoholic as me. They, they ain't chronic. They can't be. Because if I ain't got this in my life, I know I could have everything as well. I could have everything materially, but it ain't ever going to be enough. I need to fix this in here, because if I ain't fixed in here, it's game over for me, you know. I can't even I can't even be a nice person to people w without it, because I'm wrapped up with self pity. I'm wrapped up with pride. Pride is the biggest killer of all. That was my biggest flaw, I think, when I first came into recovery, especially with sharing and stuff. And I don't want to do this, and I don't want to do that. But, you know, we all have our ones that we work on, and ones that are rather some people have other defects that mine was pride and it's like it's got better over the years it's still there a lot uh, but I, I just love my life today I really do I love that I've I'm so glad I've, I, I came here and got this I really am you know if you're new just don't go out that door without getting a sponsor because you're walking away from an amazing life you, you really are might not always go to plan, but trust in God and, you know, who knows what's in store for you. 
I love you all anyway. Cheers. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and tonight's final speaker is Nathan. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name's Nathan. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. And uh, a warm welcome to anyone new to this meeting or to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I'm a grateful customer of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've just recently turned 10 years sober. And um, I, come to a, I go to a meeting that's very similar to this. It's actually the Road to Recovery meeting in Bournemouth. Um, dare I say it's probably a little bit better than this one. <laughs> and, I, and I think you've copied our style somewhat. <laughs> but uh, that's my home group, you know, and um, sort of reaching 10 years of sobriety is, is a time for reflection, and so are shares in general. And, uh, you know, my 10 years have been absolutely amazing, you know, and I wish I had the vocabulary and the passion to just tell you really how good they are, you know, and, and have been. And, um, and I certainly look forward to the, to the next ones. You know, if you're new tonight, you need to have your own, you know, and, and you really do. You know, the first three speakers have been brilliant. Um, I identify with all of them. You know, I'm a, an alcoholic that's described in our basic text. Um, one whose problem is an alcohol. You know, that was never my problem. And I sort of look back um, to when I was a kid and, you know, I'm the type of, I was the type of kid that just wouldn't be told. Sean mentioned lack of discipline, you know, and that was me. I was unteachable. Uh, I was a smart ass. Uh, I always had an answer for everything. And at the same time, I was scared. You know, I had this, this fear and I didn't really know why. And sort of very quickly, I learned that if I take something, it changes the way I feel. So I did. You know, and it didn't matter who it belonged to uh, or what it was. It was just really, I wanted more. You know, I needed something to just change me because I wasn't comfortable with myself. And, uh, and of course, again, you know, this is all with hindsight and reflection and looking back. You know, I didn't know it at the time and I found alcohol, you know, and it worked. You know, and, it, and, uh, and I sort of made a decision then, you know, and I didn't know that, but uh, that I was going to go for it. You know, and it doesn't really matter how you arrive in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, my journey's been prison and institutions. Um, at the same time, sort of getting myself together and going to university and getting a degree. Um, you know, I've done, I've done everything. I've tried everything I possibly could to just leave it alone. Um, because if you are an alcoholic of my type, uh, you'll know what it's like. You know, and it... and. I mean, our book describes it brilliantly, and you know, and like I say, I, I lack the ability to be able to do it. But um, you know how it makes us feel. You know, you can be in a room with all these people and be so lonely. You know, and you've got this sort of head that's just constantly questioning everything. You know, what's he thinking? What, what's she thinking? Um, you know, what do these people want from me? What do they want to hear from hear from me? Um, when I said my problem's not alcohol, that's me. I'm just like this ball of anxiety and fear in my stomach, and I don't know how to live life. What I do know is how to get out of my head, you know, and I'm an expert at that. Um, and the smallest of tasks, when I look back on all my life, the smallest tasks become astonishingly difficult to accomplish. So, you know, I can't keep accommodation. I can't keep relationships. You know, and I, because, I, because I wasn't one of these sort of functioning alcoholics, you know, I went for it. Um, you know, I crossed that line and, it, and I'd do anything for it. You know, and it took me to all those places that, you know, if you're in here this evening, then you probably know some of them. And like I say, the loneliness and depression and self-pity, feelings of isolation, not being able to maintain relationships, letting people down all the time, the people that you love and care about. Um, and the worst thing about it, really, was I didn't know why. And I didn't know why I kept doing it. You know, I would make promises to myself, let alone other people, you know, after another detox and another relapse, you know, I'm not doing it again. You know, I'll be gripping the sink after hobbling down the stairs, you know, on another detox, you know, and making promises to myself. And yet, you know, and Sean sort of touched on it really, you know, it's that no matter how great the necessity or wish, you know, I will never leave it alone. 
You know, and, it, and if you're in here tonight, then I'd urge you, because I, you know, to think about why you're in here. You know, and especially if you're new, because I know why I'm in here. I know why I've just travelled two and a half hours in a car after being up since five o'clock this morning um, to come down here and share this evening. You know, I know why I'm here. It's because I'm an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. You know, and um, left to my own devices without this program, I'm not well. And, and I, can, I can see that myself. You know, I look back over my life and I make decisions which are just, you know, insane. Um, I'm not a well person without this program. You know, and so therefore I need something to, to, to make me better. And like I say, you know, and I look for it. You know, I tried pretty much everything I could think of, family and, like I say, educating myself, um, and I, and I just couldn't stay stopped. You know, and it's when you come into Alcoholics Anonymous that there's a book and it tells you all about it. And like people have said, you can get yourself a sponsor, which is another recovered alcoholic, um, to take you through the 12 steps. And like Sean said, you know, get in a group like this that's full of passionate, enthusiastic people who are armed with the facts about what it's like to be us. You know, because they know what it's like to be us. And... Um, that's what I did, you know. I walked into a meeting very similar to this on a Wednesday night in Bournemouth. Over 10 years later, I haven't looked back, you know, and I haven't looked back because the first thing that happened was I got honest with myself, you know, and, and I was able to sort of, you know, just just sort of say to myself, really, you know, the, game, the game's up. You know, it's been drink till you can't drink anymore, stop. Stay stopped. You just can't stay stopped anymore and pick up again. And it's been that cycle over and over and over again to sort of one morning I wake up and it's like, you know what, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, and, and, and where do you go? You know, and, it, and my experience of that was is that all the sort of treatment and, you know, and all that sort of stuff, no one ever told me in these places about a threefold illness. You know, no one ever told me about a spiritual malady. A, f a physical um, and, a, and a mental obsession. You know, they never told me about the allergy. I never heard any of this. You know, I never heard the problem isn't alcohol, it's alcoholism. And um, it was only when I came to AA with people who I believed were like me. Uh, you know, and, and so I sort of woke up one morning and it was like, I'm done. You know, and, and I burnt the bridges. And for myself, it was prison again. Um, and then being, being released on a DRO to another sort of treatment thing. And, um, and thankfully, somebody took me to a real strong solution sort of base meeting on a Wednesday night. And, uh, and I, heard the, I, I heard the message, you know, and that's what each group has, one primary purpose. You know, there's nothing more important than carrying that message. And the message is you can recover in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and like Sean said, I wanted it. You know, I wanted it, and uh, and I would do anything for it. But, you know, with the same desire um, that I went about my drinking. You know, and that still applies today. You know, from where I've been, and I, and and how it felt, and what it was like. You know, I never want to go back there again. You know, and I'd like to stand up here and tell you jokes and make you laugh, and you know, and and all that sort of stuff. But you know what? It's not about that. You know, it's not about that. People die. You know, people relapse. People go through horrific experiences. You know, and whilst I can sing about the joys of recovery, that's the other side of the coin. So I made a decision. You know, I knew why I was in AA. And I took it seriously. You know, and, and, and that might sound to someone new, like, you know, pretty uh, depressing. You know, um, doomed to church halls on Friday nights with people you may or may not like. You know, and, and the bottom line of that is, you know what, tough. It's, you know, tough. Because, like I said, I've, I've got an illness. You know, and that means, so if I had cancer, I'd go along three times a week to get radiotherapy or, you know, or chemotherapy or whatever. Um, you know, if I had a kidney problem, I'd go and plug myself into the dialysis machine. Um, you know, I wouldn't argue with the guy about what colour the box was, you know, or why we had to be there at this time. You know, um, I wouldn't do it. 
I mean, actually, being an alcoholic, I probably would argue. <laughs> but, but I'd do it because I'd want to be well. You know, and this is no different. And in fact, this is probably in some ways the worst kind of disease because it's only us who know, know what it's like. You know, my wife is a um, uh, black belt, seventh down al and and uh, she has some idea, but only we know what it's really like. You know, and, and the people around us don't. You know, they don't know what, you know, there he is, he's doing really well. You know, why on earth would he pick up again? They don't understand. You know, but we understand, you know, and that's why it's so vital to sort of get connected with the people that are on this. And, um, you know, and I thank God I did, you know, because I, I learned some great chunks of truth about myself, you know, and that was the first thing I had to have was honesty, you know, and, uh, and I hate that word, truth, honesty, you know, who wants to do that? Who wants to be honest? Um, but I did, you know, and that truth, the first truth was, I'm an alcoholic. Now, I don't have one. I do not get away with it. And it will always be the same again. You know, and therefore, I need my medicine. You know, and for me, 10 years at my home group, um, which is, like I say, they're a road to recovery in Bournemouth, um, continual sponsorship, acting on the information that was given to me, um, laying aside, and I first heard Alexis say it, um, my childlike defiance, you know, because I have it, and, uh, and just changing. You know, Tony mentioned he doesn't like change. Who does? But I knew the truth. The truth was I needed change. And the truth was I wanted change. You know, and, and I see it in my own home group, and it's probably, it's probably quite similar here. You know, so I've been going to my home group for 10 years, and you see somebody come in who's quite new, you know, they make a great start, and then after a while, they don't want to be here anymore, or they start to question things, you know. And um, it was agreed with me at the start that I'd go to any lengths, absolutely any lengths for victory over alcohol. You know, I didn't even know what they were. It didn't matter. I was up for that. Um, and I've managed to maintain that, which is probably the hardest thing to do, um, you know, to keep maintaining that. But if you knew... Like I say, and you, you've probably seen it, you know, people come in and, it's, and there's, you know, the meeting doesn't change. You know, I've been coming to this meeting on and off um, for probably 11 or 12 years. And uh, it's still exactly the same. Same faces, um, you know, same great message. And, uh, but there's lots of people who won't be here because they changed. You know, and I see it at my meeting. People come in, they make a great start, and then it's like, you know what? Don't want to do that anymore, and I and I made the decision for myself on a, on my home group nights that from half past six, it's not about me. It's about my home group, you know. And whether they're going to face it this way, that way, whether the banner's blue, pink, green, whatever, I'm going to be here. And whether my medicine is bitter or sweet, I'm taking it. I'm taking it, you know, and, and that's not a thing to anybody else, not a promise or a decision to anybody else, but to me. Because I have faith now, because it's worked. You know, it's worked for 10 years, and, and that's the thing, you know, sort of staying sober, leaving it alone, became, was easy, absolutely easy. Um, living life on life's terms, um, as Sean said, he used the word testing, you know, it can be challenging. Um, I'm married. I have two children. Um, you know, so so things can be challenging at times. But alcoholics, if you get this program, if you follow the people in this room, uh, are blessed more than anybody else. You know, I've had two lives. I've had a life of, of prison and chaos and, you know, and, and, and good times and parties and just all the mad stuff that goes with being an alcoholic. Um, and I've had 10 years of just being consistent, you know, able to deal with bills and life and life on life's terms, you know, feeling comfortable with myself. Um, you know, and I haven't done things perfectly, but, but I've been able to live another life, a life that I would have never achieved on my own. And it's allowed me to, 
You know, the freedom I have in my life to do what I want to do is second to none. I mean, it's brilliant. I could, like I say, I really do lack the vocabulary to describe how good it is. Um, it wasn't like that when I first walked in. I had, a, I had the clothes I stood up in to a dry house. You know, ten years later, I got up at five o'clock this morning. I was able to go fishing on a river on the other side of Bournemouth, and then and then pick my children up from school, meet my wife, come down here. You know, and I'll be going back to my lovely home this evening. It never used to be like that. You know, and like I say, ten years is a sort of time to reflect. You know, how did it happen? How did it happen? You know, and and uh, and I'm sure it'd probably be read out at the end. You know, miracles do happen. Our own recovery proves that. You know, and if any, you know, ten years ago, believe me, this is a miracle. You know, and I'm not religious. It's nothing about that, you know that sort of thing. But um, you know, ask my wife. Uh, AA works. You know, ask my children. AA works. Ask my employer. AA works. You know. My family, my mum, just everybody, everybody is rippled out, um, and and it, and it, of course it begs the question: Why? You know, why did it? Well, because like I say, I got honest. I got honest. I got out of the playground. You know, and like I say, you know, and it might not be things that people want to hear, but as you know, I don't really care about that um, because this has been my experience. I got out of the playground. You know, I got off the landing. I quit the debating team and I just followed people who knew better than me, you know, and continue to do that. And, um, you know, thank God that I had those people in my life. You know, for me, it was always, you know, I'll take the easy, softer way. You know, who wants to do hard work? You know, people would say, you know, there's principles. Honesty is the best policy. No, it's not. You know, honesty doesn't get you what you want. You know, Nathan, just try your best. Why would I want to do that? You know, I want the easy way. And what I found in a good, solid home group like this was that people really showed me love. You know, and, and they told me the truth whether I wanted to hear it or not. And for the first time in my life, I wanted that. You know, I wanted to walk in at 20 past seven and someone would go, you're late. You know, and it'd be like, oh, it's a bit harsh, isn't it? Where's the love in that? Do you know what I mean? You're controlling me. You're on my case. No, no. This time things had to be different. No, they had to be different if I had wanted if I wanted to get well and have a good chance of recovery. So I wanted those people in my life. You know, I wanted people to to pull me up. You know, and and the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is they're my people. You know, this isn't a church. They're my people. And you can't black blaggers. You know, they know they know what it's like. You know, and for me that's real love. No, real love is telling people the truth, whether they want to hear it or not. And uh, and I already knew that. But this time I was willing to to actually do my bit, which was, you know what, is to, to hold my hands up and go, okay, what have I got to do? Um, and they kept it really simple. Like I said, people recovering Alcoholics Anonymous by taking the 12 steps. They're outlined in the basic text, 164 pages, and to do that, you have a sponsor. And like I say, that's another recovered alcoholic to take you through these 12 steps. I got given the same suggestions, um, you know, phone two people every day, gratitude list, minimum of six things on it, read a page or a chapter of the book, um, pray on my knees, back of my eyelids, didn't matter. Just do it. Just do what recovered people have done, and you will get what they've got. That's guaranteed, you know, and... Uh, and not only is it guaranteed, it's been my experience. Like I say, you know, 10 years of just, that's been, it's, you know, it's been wonderful. I've, been come, I've come down here to the Saints and Sinners thing and, you know, group outings, extra meeting on the Sunday, whatever it is. Do it, you know. If you want to be well, just do it. And uh, I, I have, and uh, I'm a very grateful customer of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.